From the northern shores and woodlands to the west, it's history. From copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fishery. To the farmlands of the southern counties and east to Chesapeake Bay. Look at all that waits for sportsmen across the USA. And sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow, the stillness of the forest is encased in Arctic cold. The wind might whisper through the trees and listen to his say the beauty of our great outdoors across the USA. Hi there, come on in. If you're a sportsman or you just enjoy beautiful dogs, we have some sporting dogs coming up right now on Outdoor Digest. A story on how they're trained, what goes behind all that beautiful field work you see with the field trial dogs and the hunting dogs. We also have a story about dove hunting. It's the most popular hunting across the country. Some 50 million doves are taken each year in 35 states. A few states don't have dove hunting. We'll talk about that, plus a great dove casserole. So stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's time for the Outdoor Digest. Hunting with good friends makes a perfect day, especially a friend that will jump out of the boat when you're duck hunting and retrieve your ducks. Good dog. Jackie, good dog. It's man's best friend in the rain or by the fire, in the yard, and in the field. A good hunting dog has no match. Most hunting breeds instinctively hunt and point or retrieve, but rarely will a hunting dog of any kind become a polished bird dog on its own. Behind every good bird dog's performance is usually hours and hours of patient training before the season. At our outdoor fair in June at Houghton Lake, training bird dogs was a major attraction. Misty Mark. Misty Mark. Cindy Malski sends a young Labrador retriever on a rudimentary exercise of fetching a dummy on command. This young pup is excited. You can see the playful attitude, but retrieving comes naturally to Labradors. What doesn't come naturally is bringing the dummy back to the handler, sitting down, then giving the bird to the handler. This skill is just obedience training. But we want to combine the natural instincts and love of running and hunting and retrieving with some basic learned behaviors that give the hunter control of the dog. Then both the hunter and the dog have a much happier time in the field. The goal with an advanced retriever is to take even another step, teach it to follow hand signals. This is Sharon Fowler of Sunflight Kennels. Now she wants him to come closer. Over. At times, this discipline overrides the dog's instincts, but it gives the handler better control when several ducks need to be retrieved. It doesn't take long hours, just frequent time every day working with a retriever to develop this kind of teamwork. Pointing dogs require training too, not to hunt, because they're usually full of that instinct. They range and scent game according to the abilities God gave them, and most pointers freeze instinctively when they come upon the strong scent of a game bird close by. But how long will they hold point? Are they staunch? Are they stylish? Will they break point if the bird flushes? Many hunters own good working dogs that get the job done, and they'll retrieve. Field trial obedience isn't required. But as the crowd saw at the outdoor fair, even English pointers can be refined. Experienced trainer Jerry Dealey works with his dogs to develop their style. He actually works with them on point. Can you believe that his dogs will let him move them and still hold point the whole time? Jerry trains his dogs to hold point and to be stylish when they're on point by working with them when they're very young. 
in a novel way. He stands them on a board, clips their collar to a wire. This holds their head up. He handles the dogs a lot, talks to them, gives them a lot of praise, but physically moves them and holds them in the positions he wants when they're on point. The dogs enjoy it. All dogs like attention, and they like to please their owners. You'd be surprised how much an intelligent and cooperative dog can learn from a handler. Jerry Dealey teaches his dogs style and grace that set them apart from the rest. But not every hunter wants such a polished dog. Dan McClellan owns a brace of Weimaraners, which aren't trained quite as extensively, but get along great with the family. Why Weimaraners? Weimaraner, it's, uh, it's a continental breed that uh, was brought over from Germany in the early 1900s uh, that was basically a big game hunting animal. They hunted stag form, uh, wild boar, and they were converted into bird dogs. Hmm. And they hunt close, they point, they retrieve. They're good, versatile hunting dogs for the on-foot hunter. But I know there's a problem with the show dogs versus the field dogs. You know, the show dogs are kind of funny in temperament and ability. Yeah, well, what in a lot of the Continental breeds, uh, what we see as a splitting of the breed, we see the uh, show people that, that are breeding for confirmation, and I don't knock them at all because they're trying to improve the breed, and I think they do a heck of a job. Uh, but what field trial people and, and hunting people have to keep in mind is it's, there's two things to breed for, and that's pointing instinct and desire for the dog to find birds. And you need to breed the best to the best in pointing and desire in order to get the best. And in wine runners, we have several lines in this country that are excellent bird dog, shooting dog lines. And uh, then you have the others. Why aren't they more popular though? They can be if they're bred right. So why aren't they more of them bred right? Well, I think that uh, you have a couple other breeds, the German Shorthairs, the Brittany's, uh, the English yeah. Setters, the English Pointers, that, that uh, when a lot of people get started into hunting, into field trialing, they look to more popular breeds. Uh, um, but my own experience is uh, I have seen some wine runners do some real nice retrieving work, uh, real nice bird work, real nice pointing work, and they're a, they're a dog that you can live with in your home, that is good with the children, they're very protective, they're very biddable. Um, for the all-around dog, you can't, I don't think you can beat them. Uh, they're not the best pointing dog, they're not the best retrieving dog, but uh, all in all, uh, as a versatile hunting dog and a pet and a member of the family and companion, they're excellent. I get the feeling that whatever breed Dan owned, he'd love them. And that's the way it is with hunting dogs. We like to look at them. We like to hunt with them. They're the best buddy a hunter could have. Good boy. Good boy. <laughs> Sporting dogs are great when it comes to hunting upland game. For deer, most hunters go it alone and fishing. Heck, I don't know of anybody who uses a dog. But all of these anglers seem to make their way by themselves into our trophy book. Russell Lohr has quite a nice walleye, almost 10 and 3 quarter pounds. Here's Darwin Nault with a trophy 2 pound, 3 ounce perch, 15 inches long. Norm Anderson's largemouth bass weighed over six pounds. It was 22 and a half inches long. Miles Benedict took this dandy 12-point buck with his handgun. It had a 17 and an eighth inch spread. Frank Schultz's 13-pointer had a 17 and a half inch spread. He took that with a rifle. Chuck Goldie's uh, deer was 11-pointer with a 20 and a half inch spread. He took it with his bow and arrow. And here's Ewell Adams with this 18-pound, six-ounce gobbler that he called in. Jerry Allarding is a catfish angler extraordinaire. He fishes catfish a lot. Says it's all pretty simple. He caught an 18-pound, six-ounce flathead to prove it. That's all I fish for is for cats. We stay all night. My wife and I spend all most of the night fishing for cats. And what do you use for bait? Well, we're using either crawlers or using minnows. Minnows on the on the flatheads. So you fish differently for flatheads than you do for channel cats? Yes. I found that the flatheads prefer live bait. So you're using about a six or seven inch minnow, eight inch minnow sometimes, fishing on the bottoms. 
Well, Jerry Allarding, you may think that there's not all that much to catfish fishing. In fact, you make it sound really simple and easy. But I'll bet you really get excited when you've got a big old cat on like this one. Regardless, though, there's no doubt that you're worthy to be our Outdoor Digest Trophy Angler of the Week. According to statistics from the National Safety Council, shooting is 3,000 times more safe than playing football. In fact, sports shooting is so safe it's not even mentioned in the list of accidents causing deaths or injuries compiled by insurance companies. At least 1,000 Chinook salmon, full-grown Chinook salmon, will be crossing from Michigan waters to Indiana waters in a truck. Fish lighters that were supposed to bring the fish to the Hoosier State are not yet completed, so hatchery trucks will deliver the 20-pound-plus fish instead. British Columbia game wardens will now be able to release captured bears more safely. Larry Campbell of Cranbrook has invented a remote control device to automatically open the bear trap doors. Now, prior to this, most wardens used to release the bears by op- opening the doors manually. Two years ago, a Montana warden was almost killed by a grizzly bear while releasing the door. California Judge Donald Balding has been awarded a Certificate of Appreciation for his dedication to conservation. Judge Balding has, according to California conservation officers, demonstrated his support for wildlife by closing the door on hardcore poachers and increasing court fines and sentences. Conservation officers are now entering the computer world. A major conservation organization and magazine called the International Game Warden Association says officers in some states are writing their reports in the field using laptop computers. What? According to an Associated Press article, the number of anti-gun bills and proposed ordinances has slowed down for the first time since this assault rifle business started. This anti-assault rifle frenzy is darn near officially over, and that's good news. But there's a reason. The issue isn't as sexy as it was a few months ago, and all but the Johnny-come-lately politicians have figured it out and joined in on some other bandwagon. In the meantime, though, some guns, and I mean hunting guns, got banned in California. A number of cities passed some stupid ordinances because it was, to them, a politically smart thing to do. And yet another wave of silly anti-gun laws came crashing down on law-abiding citizens. Now, it's important to remember that no drug dealer lost any sleep over these new laws. Felons who rape, rob, and kill really aren't affected. Heck, they violate the laws on a regular basis anyway. And therein lies the tragedy. The only people who will feel the pinch of these new gun laws are folks who are normally law-abiding citizens. The bad guys who caused the problem in the first place have gotten away scot-free one more time. What favorite food of white-tailed deer has been, and still is in Europe, eaten by humans? American Indians made a meal from crushed white acorns, the sweetest tasting nut of the oak family, and a favorite food of wildlife. People in southern Europe often boil and eat white acorns today. Sportsmen across the country will soon be asked to gear up for the 18th observance of National Hunting and Fishing Day on Saturday, September 23, 1989. Established as the fourth Saturday in September by Congressional Resolution in 1971, National Hunting and Fishing Day honors sportsmen for their contributions to conservation. Hank Williams Jr., Country Music's Entertainer of the Year for the past three years, will be the first to serve two years as Honorary Chairman for National Hunting and Fishing Day. An avid hunter and gun collector, Williams is an ardent spokesman for the shooting sports. One of Country Music's hottest stars, Hank Williams Jr., never forgets his roots. He says hunting and fishing are as much a part of our heritage as country music. And according to Williams, who grew up with both, he's anxious to tell others about the tradition and the fun associated with the outdoors. Now the theme for National Hunting and Fishing Day is for the tradition and for the fun. In recognition of the role that hunters and fishermen play in our national heritage and the wholesome recreation enjoyed by millions of Americans. To date, hunters and fishermen have spent over $7 billion for conservation programs. That's right, $7 billion. 
For additional information on upcoming activities, call the National Hunting and Fishing Day headquarters at area code 203-762-1320. My buck. <laughs> Second year in a row. I mean, it's just, dove hunting in the South is very much a, a uh, if I can use the word, genteel sport. Uh, lots of guys that have been hunting doves for years together, they get together, they meet at a farm, they, you know, they pay farmers money to crop fields certain ways, mm -hmm. so they'll track doves, they have a nice leisurely shoot, they go back to the farmhouse, they have a big barbecue for they go home. Uh, it's, it's a very, very social event. Lots of times their wives will come out and meet them for the barbecue afterwards, uh, down in Tennessee where I go every year to hunt doves. I'm... This is a big social event of the season. Uh, I don't know what the population estimate is for Michigan, uh, but we would expect the effect on the population of doves in Michigan to be the same as it is on doves in any other state, and that's none. Uh, when uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service conducted a study of uh, dove and dove hunting and non-dove hunting states from 1975 to 1980, they found that the breeding effort, number of breeding birds, number of birds in hunted and unhunted states to be virtually identical. Was it in Indiana more of an emotional reaction against hunting doves than a biological reaction? Definitely. We have quite a few people that live in the cities and uh, they go by what they've seen at their bird feeder and what they've seen on television and not necessarily how things actually are on the land. They're, they're, many of our people are quite removed from the land and they may not understand the exact biological nature of things. What is the biological nature that they don't understand? Probably that there is an excess of doves, that many of them are going to pass away, if you will, uh, whether they're hunted or not, and there are some people who enjoy hunting and should be allowed to hunt, uh, and it won't uh, harm the species at all. Are the, what about the, what happens to doves, what happened to the doves in this state when they were not hunted? Most of them probably went down, well, most of them died naturally, let's say up to 80% a year from uh, hawks, owls, winter, uh, ice, cold. Uh, those that didn't probably moved south more and more as the temperature got, got worse and uh, ended up just overwintering in the south and then came back here in the spring. Okay, you say 80% mortality of doves, it's estimated to be 70-80%. If hunters take 10%, wouldn't that mean added to the 70-80% or 80%, that there would only be 10% left? No, that's, there was one lady that told me that 80% uh, are going to die naturally and hunters want to kill the other 20%, but that's not the way it is. The hunters portion comes off the top almost. It's like the cream off the top. And uh, only those that uh, die of natural causes after the hunting just bring it down to the natural 30 or 20 percent that are going to overwinter anyhow and come back in the spring. So the hunter's take is a part of the 70 percent. Yes, it yes it does need into the uh, to the 20 or 30 percent that are going to overwinter and come back. Are the doves that frequent people's bird feeders? around the suburbs, the same doves that are flying out here in the field? Uh, banding practices have shown that that's probably not the case, that if a dove flies two, five miles maybe for his, uh, to his feeding area, and we don't, for instance, get any birds here from Fort Wayne or LaGrange or even Mongo for that matter. Mm -hmm. They're all birds from right around this area that are coming here. So backyard birds tend to be backyard birds. That's true. Wild birds of the field Pe tend to stay wild. That's true. People who grew up in the city like the city. People who grew up in the country generally like the country. Same with birds. Yes, sir. As far as I'm concerned, from a hunting point of view, it's another animal. They certainly are beautiful animals, but I don't feel that hunting the doves will interfere with uh, other people's enjoyment of doves. I've lived in two other states, uh, Maryland and Virginia specifically, hunted doves in both states, and they still came to the bird feeders there, and they still behave the same way as they do here in Michigan. And in a very short while, I'll be taking a little bit of a vacation in Maryland, and the doves still come to my mother's feeder right through dove season. So from that point of view, I, I, don't, I can't understand those objections. 
Did you get any complaints that people had less doves at their bird feeders this past winter? Uh, some of the staunch non-hunters in this area actually thought that there were more doves around, and, and, and they said that they understood that it did not harm the season. That's about as good as an endorsement as you can get for the biological uh, yes. reasons for hunting. And these people that I know would go out of their way to tell me if they thought it had hurt the season mm -hmm. or hurt the dove population. And uh, they had to, they just admitted that it did not. This is a dove recipe. Very simply done, too. It is, and it's excellent. It's excellent meat. I've been nibbling on it here. It is truly a delicacy. It is. But first, take a look at, I know there's a lot of concern about the birds, the size of the birds. Right there they are. There's two plucked doves that I plucked out of the dozen or so that Bob Garner and I brought back. They're small birds, to be sure, our smallest game bird in this country, but they have little legs, little wings with meat on them that is definitely worth saving and eating. As I said, I plucked these, Kathy, which I think with all game birds, it tastes better to, to pluck oh, the birds. Oh, rather than skin? Right, and these are weigh four ounces. I put them on the scale after I plucked them, and they weigh four ounces. They, I saved all of the giblets, at least the hearts, and the gizzards. Well, and that'd be good done just in butter, just yeah. like that. Now, there's a dozen. That's a limit of doves in Indiana. And you see the little gizzards, uh, they're tasty, and there's quite a few of them when you put them together, a couple ounces of meat. And you know, a couple ounce serving, uh, a quarter pounder is four ounces. That's right. You take two boneless dove breasts, and you have a quarter pounder right there. These doves here were prepared different ways. This is one that has been eviscerated and plucked. The tips of the wings cut off and the tips of the legs cut off. Looks like a little chicken or a sure Cornish does. game hen. This one I skinned and I took off the saddle section with the uh, legs on it. But you can see all the meat. It's, it's not exactly white meat, it's a little it's bit dark darker. because they're yeah. flying birds, but there is the, the back legs and you can see there's lots of meat on those when they're skinned. And here's a breast the way most people prepare doves. You end up with about two and a half ounces, two, two and a half ounces of breast right there. There it is, you can see the meat uh, there's lots of it on a dove once you take the feathers off. And this is what we prepared. We had a dozen of them there, but we're going to cook six of them with your method for dove casserole. Very good. Okay, we're going to bring water to just a boil here. We're going to add two tablespoons of sage, which sounds like a lot, mm -hmm. and it would be. You'd never want to add that just as it is, but because it's going to be in the boiling water, we're going to go ahead and add two tablespoons. And let that boil for a few minutes there. Now this is ground sage, which is even more pungent than it would be if it was just a dried mm -hmm. leaf. I don't taste it in this dove that I'm eating no, right now. No, you wouldn't because it's, um, we drop the doves in there for just a few minutes. You don't want to boil the doves at all. You just want to tenderize them in the sage. It I, does it must, give it a flavor, but you're, you're not going to taste it. It's not strong at all. No, not at all. Okay, we're going to drop these in here for five minutes. Let them just kind of sit there in the hot water. Not don't want it to boil anymore after this point right here. And we've tried skinned, plucked, and some of the back legs. Right, just as is. I definitely think it's worthwhile. Oh, yeah, save the back I legs do too. And all of the meat that you sure, can get. Sure, you don't want to throw it out. Okay, we're gonna put these into a casserole dish after they've sat there. Now, at this point, the best way to fix doves, of course, is moist, mm -hmm. moist heat. You don't want to, you can broil them, but you want it done very fast, three to five minutes, and that's it. Well, these are tasty that I'm eating right here. <laughs> they are very moist. They are. They, they will stay that way. Okay, now we're going to pour butter over the top. You could put a pat of butter in each one, but this is a much simpler way mm -hmm. here. Just pour some butter over the top. I think I can taste the butter. <laughs> no, I really, I really think I can. Okay, because it's, um, we just poured some on top, so mm -hmm. there may be a little bit more than if you just put a pat in each. A little bit of salt. And a little bit of pepper, just a dash mm -hmm. for flavor in here. Okay, now here comes the good way, the way we like our food here. Mm. Mushroom soup, simple. These, these mushrooms that I'm eating right now are good, good. <laughs> okay, that's going to give it just a little bit more texture there, too. Mm -hmm. I think with the butter. That's right. Okay, it makes there it very moist. Nice, I moist thought, method. I would have thought that with the way you spread that mushroom soup on there, that it wouldn't have, oh, some sure of these would have been dried out, It'll, but it, nope. it spread around, and it you can sure see does. the butter in there. Sure does. Kathy, this is phenomenal, isn't I it? I think I'm going to try it. I think that this, I'm sold on dove hunting and doves myself. 
So, yep. But I don't see, I don't have a problem with this. As long as you use a game animal or a game bird for food. And we've used every bit of it. Every bit for food. It's tasty. That's right. And knowing that there's 50 million taken, about a half a billion out there every year, I don't have any problem with it. All down south, they serve it in restaurants. They do. They, it's on the menu in the That's south. That's right. A lot of people will go out of their way to get it. I would. You don't have to go far for this recipe, which works well with all small game, even chicken. It's in our September-October issue of the Outdoor Digest magazine. Of course, all of our September-October recipes are included in a handy cutout format. Now that wraps up another edition of Outdoor Digest. I hope you tell your friends about this show. We try to maintain a fast-paced, upbeat, positive hunting and fishing show, always bringing back something for the table. So write to us if you want our recipes, and please join us next week, same time, same station. Next week on Outdoor Digest, we're going to study whitetail deer. Now, we've done this numerous times before over the years, but this time we're taking to the air in a hot air balloon. We're going to look down and observe the deer patterns, their habitat, where they live, how they move. So join us next week right here on public television.